Thank you so much for the introductions. Thank you to our panelists and thank you everyone for being here. It's been a very inspiring morning and um, I think many of the, the questions and, and, and concerns that have been raised in Prof Kwok's uh, keynote address and in, and in the earlier panel uh, will be questions and concerns that we'll continue to address in this panel. Now you can submit your questions at any time and we'll make sure that we have time for discussion after some initial presentations from the panel. Beginning with you please, Rebecca. Thank you, Roger, and hello, everybody. Um, it's been a joy and pleasure for me to have worked two decades in an 85-year-old arts academy where I'm able to witness first-hand accounts of the living legacies of endurance. So for us as artists educators, part of our challenge is to interpret the past and to imagine the future. And one of the key areas that we have concerned ourselves about would be professional identities of our teachers and also of our students. So in signature pedagogies in the arts, some of the common concerns that we affirm would be apprenticeship, sustained mentorship, peer and self-critique, and various modes of inquiry, learning and teaching. But because we want to challenge ourselves to contemporize signature pedagogies for the arts, we have increasingly begun to find creative collaboration, embodied cognition, and even reflexive practices as some of the key drivers that will push us forward to an imagined future. Now, while we recognize these enduring traditions, we also want to realize that the market today is dynamic over and above the industry and the institution. And this makes us rethink about our values of professionalism in the arts. And these are some of the key thrusts that we have been concerned about in recent times. What is self-regulation? What does professionalism mean? What does social responsibility and conduct mean in today's arts landscape? And another intersecting concern that we have would be about how our learners are learning today. We have three kinds of learners as well in the arts academy and colleges. The first kind would be professionals who have already established themselves even prior to enrollment. The second kind would be the professionals that we build before their point of graduation. And the third kind with generative AI and chat GPT would be the self-made professionals, the ones who do not receive formal training. So this challenges us to rethink the arts landscape and the learners that we are going to be developing in our pedagogy and our curriculum. Acknowledging that there are alternative forms of learning would help us to invigorate creative ambiguity. And this form of ambiguity would be liberatory and give us the power to transform. And that's my five minutes, Roger. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> and now over to you, Sissy. Oh dear. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, a little bit shy of five minutes, I should think, but more for a discussion later. I wonder whether before we consider any new anything, let alone an agenda, we, we might pause for today. What the present is, is between the past and the future. Some philosophers would think that this is the moment to pause, to think, to have a conversation with oneself. So let's contemplate together. Some people think that there are three dimensions to power. I have power over you if I can make you do something that you would otherwise not do. I also have power over you if I set your agenda. So if we want to step back from doing so, perhaps be more consultative, better still, collaborative, and that is the operative word from this morning. How what might we achieve the conditions for working together? 
Here I learn from my colleagues of longer histories of different institutions. And I think of the way in which arts could shape preferences. That's the third dimension of power. So if power is not to be understood only as being something exerted over, something that dominates, but actually something that could be generated together, I think we've been invited today to create together with the launch of the UAS logo. What is this thing that we could endeavor to articulate through arts education, be it practice, pedagogy, or research? There are three moments that I pick out, perhaps in response to some of the sharings this morning. First, the quotes that we saw um, from the founders of both LaSalle and NAFA mentions the nation. Education as a nation-building endeavor. I invite us first to pause, to think about what that means. The violence that comes with every founding may be a necessary violence. What has been suppressed? What gets erased? What is now coming back? What are the cycles, not just of history, but the charting of historiographies, that mapping of everything that comprises perhaps the domain in which our studies are situated, whether we are in a learning role, in an administrative role, or a teaching role. So that's point number one. If education is not just to build up a city-state or build up a national or professional identity. What can it do? We might then move on to practice. Some think that practice is opposed to theory or runs alongside it as two distinct action. I'd like to bring us together and think about praxis. A word, yes, rooted in the Greek, pratain, but a word that also signals a making, a doing, a being that is always intertwined with the social, embedded in transformation. That is what moves education, I should like to think, especially an education embedded in the arts and practices whether we consider it art or craft, if we step away from the semantics and think about the iterative ways in which we try, make errors, hit a dead end, discover the cul-de-sac and come back. It takes time, yes. We need to make time, yes. But what are we making for? In this world, that perhaps holds too much overproduction. Third moment, in terms of forward-lookingness, um, perhaps opposed to future-proofing, I don't know that I want to be future-proof. I know I'm not waterproof, right? So how do we use our words? How do texts actually move us? in the same way that we could read the language of the bodies of the year two diploma dance students from NAFA just now? How does it enhance the musical language and the symbolism that some of us might have been trained to pick up? What if we don't understand Hokkien? Does it stop us from appreciating? So what is it that education provides us with? And what arts education, in particular, is uniquely placed to give us a chance to do is to dwell in interpretability. That there is nothing that is objective in the world, perhaps. We can name certain things facts, and we can call certain things evidence, but know that there is power in that rhetorical determination. And it could be otherwise. So if art could help us think 
otherwise. That might be why arts educational institutions might move into thought leadership because we need, desperately need, an arts thinking. That might seem less purposive than what key performance indicators would like to guide us towards. That we pause, not move back, not move forward, but take that moment to think for ourselves and to cultivate a freeing that comes from within, inside out. E. Dukara education. And thank you, Sisi. Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Sisi, for that very eloquent presentation. So hard to follow uh, from that. Uh, in reflecting on, on this theme of practice, pedagogy, and research, uh, I, I was thinking of uh, uh, a cognate institution for the uh, University of the Arts, and uh, it led me to uh, the University Museum, uh, in which I worked in Manila before I, I moved to Singapore to work at the uh, NGS. I think the University Museum is an important site to consider in terms of reflecting on practice pedagogy and research, uh, also in relation to the uh, philosophy around uh, the University of the Arts. Uh, the University Museum as an institution contains two important moments of, of modernity. The university, which uh, produces uh, uh, secular knowledge, and the museum, which represents through, through material. So for me, the uh, University Museum is an exceptionally productive site for this convergence of practice, pedagogy, and research. It's like a, a teaching hospital or a, a research institute. So the University Museum uh, curates, it archives, it teaches, it uh, researches and it gathers people. So I think this is uh, an important thing to consider, this like cognate uh, formation in relation to the University of the Arts. But the question, of course, is uh, methodology. How does the University Museum or the uh, University of the Arts uh, uh, perform its function? So one one way to do it is to enhance the disciplines by uh, pluralizing, like you have interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, or cross-disciplinarity. I think that is one way to do it. But for me, the other way to do it is to recover the humanities as a, a broader perspective uh, through which to think of a methodology of the University of the Arts uh, in the present. It is a humanities that is not of the liberal kind. It is not obsessed with uh, personal choice, but uh, sensitive to this material condition. I'm thinking, for instance, of the digital humanities. Uh, that might inflect our recovery of the humanities and also of environmental humanities that uh, looks at this broad ecology in which uh, uh, an interspecies uh, interspecies relationships might might uh, might thrive so in this regard I'm drawn to the thinking of the uh, curator and uh, uh, philosopher, uh, Clementine Delis, who, who flips the phrase university museum to museum university, in which uh, the museum thinks like a university and the university thinks like a museum. And I would like to share her manifesto, a bit of a manifesto of the museum university. And it says, 
It's an equivocally collection-centered, working outward from actual exhibits, deconstructing earlier archives and histories of ethnographic museums, introducing external impulses, an epistemological generalism, a democratic intellect, a non-standardized education, as independent as possible, providing a new platform for professional development, connecting the next generation of global cultural protagonists from curatorial studies, cultural studies, post-colonial studies, contemporary art, design, performance, art history, anthropology, creative writing, law, ecology, mathematics, and more, breaking open the disciplines of the past and their collections. So that's the first part of this reflection. The second part is context, and I was drawn this morning to the, uh, this discussion around Southeast Asia as an important context. I think we should seriously uh, think about that as a, a vital element in our conceptualization of the University of the Arts in, in Singapore. This uh, Southeast Asia, uh, this category of, South, of Southeast Asia, not as a geopolitical construction, but uh, for me as a vector, the Southeast as a vector, not really Southeast Asia as a geopolitical entity. The Southeast is, for me, critical because it is not the center twice, not, not, or not, not the West and not the uh, North. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is also, um, so first it's critical. Second is, let me review my notes. Second, it is uh, intersectional because we have to coordinate the, the, the South and the East. And thirdly, it is translocal. It moves between ecologies, uh, colonial histories, uh, uh, cosmologies, and uh, uh, yeah, and so on. So I end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Sassy. Thank you, Roger. <clears throat> when we began conceiving uh, an academy for theater 20 years ago, which began life as the theater training and research program, and now is called the Intercultural Theater Institute, the fundamental question that we asked was this. What is absolutely necessary for the artist to know to remain autonomous? What does the artist need to do? What are the skills, the crafts, the strategies? What is the cunning that must be learned? in order to do work which is significant to his or her community, that is meaningful, that speaks to people, that has the capability to move, that can provoke, that can engender discovery, that can inspire, and that can bring people together. Basically, we were asking what the artist needs to be responsible for. What is the agency that the artist must develop, that he or she must learn and cultivate, protect and defend in order to practice within their own communities, wherever that might be. 
one of the first things we decided that was absolutely essential is the negotiation of difference. How do we encounter difference? How do we engage difference? And ultimately, how can we learn from difference? So that something creative, something shared, something positive might come out of it. What are the skills that are necessary? What is involved, for instance, in translation? What must we learn in order to enable translation to happen? How do we learn to listen? How do we learn to wait? How do we avoid assuming an answer? How can we become more self-aware of our own biases and our own prejudices and our prejudgments before we enter the studio to work with another artist? What does it mean to treat your fellow artists as an equal? And what is the fundamental ethics involved in the exchange of ideas, materials, technologies, knowledges, systems, methodologies that can be combined to create work which is new and original and significant. In a word, ladies and gentlemen, work that is meaningful. This was the challenge that we faced. And our answer was that it lied, the answers lay partially in what has already been done, been done in theater. In the immense oceans of traditional theater that's already been practiced and are continuing to live how can the contemporary actor learn and draw what is significant in order to be able to reuse this, repurpose this knowledge to say what is relevant today for the here and the now? How do we understand context? What does it mean for a form or an expression to have lived for 400 years so that it still speaks to an audience? What are the cultural implications? What are the sensitivities? And how might we engage in this work in a respectful, humble manner so that we create spaces which are safe and secure and which are fundamentally open for exchange to happen. Now, why were these some of the issues we were concerned with? Because these were issues that were fundamental to us as Singaporeans. We live in a state of extreme interculturality. We live in liminal spaces. We live in environments, in sonic environments, which are infused with translations, which are interrupted and disrupted by the fact that we may not understand a phrase or completely understand a sentence that a neighbor is speaking or a fellow traveler 
is in, engaged in the conversation. But we need to find a means to continue working. We need to find a means to continue to connect in order that we may create and recombine what we have to offer, what each of us has to offer as an individual so that something significant can result. So the question is, in this day and age, when we have more knowledge than we can possibly use in our handphones, in our pockets, what do we need to cultivate the responsibilities of an artist? What should they engage in? And how can they learn to be open? My provocation earlier this today, my polemic, as some have has called it, was a plea that the arts be not instrumentalized. That the art and art practice does not become a means to an end, whatever that end might be, economic, political, ideological, nation building. I think the fundamental thing for the evolution of a new agenda for the arts is that the arts be at the front and center of the work that's being done in the institution. That the practice of the artist be understood and given its rightful place in the institution so that it may find its own level in society. And so that we can finally, finally stop having to justify the arts where we live. Thank you. Thank you, Sasi. And Paul, please. Thank you, Sasi. Thank you, Roger. Um, I'm going to build on Sasi's comments, actually, a little bit. And this appeals to the educators, the arts educators out there, who Sasi has challenged to reconsider what you're going to do with your students in the classroom. I'm also going to talk about AI. I'm, I'm sorry, we have to re revisit that topic. It's, it might be getting tiring, but there's a, there's a crucial difference today in, in that AI is a generative tool. We've not had generative tools in recent time. We've not had tools that can emulate creativity or emulate ideas. Um, and it's an important point for us as arts educators to consider what is it that we now need to, to look and evaluate of our students who are learning the arts. I do believe that in this watershed moment, we do have to decide on what our own new agendas are in the learning of the arts with these tools that have obviously come to existence since November last, last year. One of the ways that we articulate our demands on the people that we want to nurture and, and, and teach uh, is through assessments. And assessments is something that uh, we've actually started to see the, the largest impact um, of generative AI tools intervening upon it. Uh, assessments in both textual assessments and to some extent, uh, visual objects. Uh, in my university, where uh, in NTU, this semester was the first semester that we started receiving assessment, uh, students' assignments uh, that had high degrees of uh, generated AI content. And we've had to you know, have conversations with students and say, hey, uh, which part of this is yours? <laughs> and 
we've had to actually, we're, we're still thinking, we've not even come up with a solution yet. We're still thinking, what's really important now, now that we have such affordances? Uh, we, know we, we know that we still want to hear the student's voice. However, how can tools such as these assist students in learning? And these are questions that we obviously have to ask. Fortunately, um, painting and sculpture are relatively safe because the AI hasn't developed the hand to put, you know, to hold the brush into paint, so that's quite safe. But text is at some risk, I would say. The other community of learners that are at risk, uh, potentially the kindergarten to secondary school children. Uh, when I say at risk, uh, pinch of salt, please. It's it's a challenge. One of the benefits or one of the, the beauties of art education from kindergarten to secondary is the ability for a child to imagine, to say, oh, I have this abstract idea or maybe I want to draw my city of the future or I, I want to draw my dream car. And the beauty of art education is for the child to be able to translate that abstract idea sitting somewhere in his head or her head and putting it out into a diagram on a piece of paper or a sculpture. And it's these skills, these, these, these abilities that are, uh, it's phenomenal abilities for the child that will carry the child through to adulthood and, and hopefully see the child's success. Now, generative tools are able to automate some of that, those things. I mean, the child now, I mean, if you wanted to, could go into uh, uh, Dali 2 and say, and put in his dream house in, in, in a textual format and let Dali 2 sort that out for him or her. And I think that's, that's a challenge, that's a, that's a shame actually, that, that's a pity. Because we, we want to be able to develop uh, the, children, the child's ability to imagine, to envision. Uh, not to be an artist per se, but to be able to carry these, these merits and these tools with them in, in, their, in their future jobs and careers and vocations. So this new agenda, this call, um, is for arts educators out there to really, really consider what's really important, what can be offloaded, how could we work with generative tools, and at what point in time should we do without it? Should we draw lines? And at what point in time should we say, no, we need to have this here with us? So this is a provocation, and I hope it generates some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And Chao Hui, please. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Um, I feel like I've gate-crashed this uh, panel, actually, because I'm the only representative from the industry, so I will, uh, will want to contribute from that perspective. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I would really want to look into my, my interest and my contribution to today's conversation and discussion is, is about the relevance and the importance of what arts means to design. Um, and of course, we will throw in the technology part as well. I think, uh, Paul, rightly, you, you, to bring up the, the discussion of AI, uh, eventually we'll touch on it. But it's arts. What's the relationship of arts to design? And design being a creative force uh, and a capability that will power the economy. Right? I really want to bring the arts into the conversation. Um, and talking about the economy, perhaps uh, allow me to just set the scene of what we are facing today. Um, and some people call it the burning platform. Uh, and probably you know about it already as well, but you know, we, we could just go through it again. Uh, three things, I think, which are, we are confronted with. Uh, and is this right now, we are moving uh, since the 1800s from the Industrial Revolution to the, the, innovation, uh, to the innovation economy. Um, and we are described as being in the Industrial Revolution 4.0, which is the whole digitalization. And, and we're all feeling it, right, from the way we live, the way we play, we lay, the way we work. Uh, and, and this fella here probably is the biggest symbol and, and the biggest game changer in our life. And not to mention all the disruptive technology that we, are, that we have to confront with, um, electrification, autonomous uh, technology, AI, and of course, generative AI, uh, which has caught our attention and interest uh, so much over the last uh, few months. So that's the first burning platform. At the same time, I think we are also looking into a fundamental shift in global and social challenges. Um, by that, I refer to 
issues like sustainability. I think until COP26, actually the world didn't quite take attention to climate change and topics like that. It very much was sitting in, in corporate boardrooms and even government are not taking too much attention to it. But I think finally, um, the institutions, the governments, the companies, right, and society at large is really taking attention to such a topic and it's going to confront us and we, have, we cannot ignore it. It's something that we have to weave into the work that we do. Right? Companies are already shaping sustainability as part of uh, the business model uh, and consumption models and so on and so forth. The other part on this burning platform is about on the social causes part of it. It's about uh, topics such as inclusiveness, right? bridging economic divide. How do we serve the underprivileged, the underserved? Uh, we can't ignore this anymore right? because the world is getting smaller and the issues cannot be treated at arm's length. Uh, the ripple effect that we feel, and we felt it already in COVID, of course, right? where the entire world uh, will probably be going through something very similar um, in the future. Aging population, that we can also classify uh, under the social causes as well. And finally, but not the least, is, uh, is geopolitics. Uh, I think somebody mentioned this, and I think this is important for us to take into consideration. It is the impact on the economy and the economic choices that we all take, companies, government, it has a profound implication because this new world order that we are in actually um, would be influencing business practices. And we need creativity to mitigate around such political landscapes. And in fact, there's a new word being coined, which is uh, politics, which is business plus politics. Again, you can't separate the two because um, as we have all gone through COVID and in fact it was the pandemic that has surfaced this dire situation uh, of geopolitics and you can see also that um, there is a jostling of positions that we can take and take advantage of right, with this geopolitics where the geocultural economic um, relevance will come into play. So I guess this sets the scene of how do we ready our workforce to be resilient in the, in the new economy, but also with this burning platform around us. And if you look into um, the study on the future of jobs by the World Economic Forum, and you, know, you, you can refer to it over the last few years, it hasn't changed a lot, but out of the 10 skills that they have stated to be the ones relevant to help the world manoeuvre into the next decade, seven out of ten of which actually are capabilities which resonates with how a design capabilities are trained in. Just let me give you a few examples. Critical thinking is one of them. The other is outright calling of creativity, that you need creativity right, to really get yourself uh, uh, to be resilient right, in the next decade or so. The transdisciplinary practice part of it is another call out uh, and complex problem solving. I think if you look at all this, these are really uh, what designers are trained in or the creative capabilities. And I think this, is against the, uh, this was against the background that the, um, the Design Education Review Committee uh, was put together uh, and this committee, uh, which I'm chairing, uh, it brings together all the IHLs, all the representatives from all the IHLs in Singapore, including a good cross-section of uh, design disciplines uh, also represented uh, in the committee itself. It's to see how we could develop Singapore's next generation of creative problem solvers. Well, essentially, back to the point I'm making is how do we ready our workforce in this new economy? And, well, it's... The tasks that we are given uh, are actually uh, to see how we could up the quality of design education, uh, especially focusing on transdisciplinary practice. And the other mandate that we've been given, it is to see how we can infuse design sensibilities into the rest of the IHL, right? uh, meaning that we recognize that design would be a very needed creative 
problem-solving capabilities that we need to infuse into everybody, right? You could be trained to be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, right? But that component of creative thinking needs to be infused. So, uh, just to finish off, uh, that this committee has actually uh, put together uh, a few recommendations, one of which is actually it's to project a point of vision of what design education should be and could be for Singapore in the next 30 years. It's a bold projection, right? Uh, three decades into the future. Uh, but I think it's exactly that we know that technology would change and that is why it's so important that we are courageous enough or we should be courageous enough to plant a flag quite far ahead so that, that we are not um, influenced uh, or be led by technological changes. So that's one, right? Uh, it's, it's about a point of vision. The second is about how do we amalgamate the practicing industry and the design education sector together. We really want to shift the relationship of one from supply and demand where the schools or the IHL supply and the industry just simply absorb it, right? Which is very transactional. We really want to see how we could amalgamate this relationship, blur the line, such that then it becomes a collaborative co-create of capabilities needed for us to drive the economy. Right. Um, I'll probably stop at this point here, but back to where I started, right? Uh, I really would like to have uh, out from this conversation, how do we forge a new relationship between, or maybe revive the position right, of arts uh, to that of design? and have a direct line of sight to the relevance to us maneuvering into the new economy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chao Hui. While each of you have been speaking, we've been receiving questions from the audience. And it's striking to me that we have six people on the stage who all have an interest in arts education, and yet your presentations that the the, the questions and concerns that you've chosen to focus on have been quite diverse. By contrast, the questions that we're receiving, um, several of them centre on this issue of interdisciplinarity. So before I zoom in on some more specific topics and press each of you a little on some of the things you've, you've introduced in your opening remarks, I'd like to ask each and every one of you to say something about this concept of interdisciplinarity. It's a buzzword, we've heard it more times already today than we can count, and yet it has specific um, and differing meanings for each of us in relation to research, in relation to practice, in, and in relation to our teaching or pedagogy. So in whichever order you'd like, interdisciplinarity please. Then we can tick off several of these questions. Okay, uh, can I start? Um, I would, in, in my view, there is a great um, affinity between interculturality and interdisciplinarity. We are talking about uh, a cap capability, uh, a capability or a means that enables a person, an artist, uh, to uh, engage or interact with others who are recognizably different uh, and uh, who are capable of then coherently working through problems, solving issues, engaging in dialogue, negotiating so that a shared outcome may result. This could be a play, uh, this could be an agreement, this could be a deal, uh, this could be anything you can conceive of with imagination, but essentially it involves the capability to cross boundaries, to engage in difference and to come up with positive outcomes. That's what I would define it as. Um, 
maybe I'll maybe I'll just throw something here and for everybody to ponder a bit, right? Um, when is an artist a craftsman? And when is a craftsman a designer? And when is a designer an artist? You can think along economic lines, you can think about along expression, you can think about, think along uh, in the disciplinary lines, uh, axis, right? But I, but I think this is uh, something which I think is, is, is for us to really think about because I think we may have, you know, either um, uh, just place some difficulty on ourselves by, by labeling all this in separation, right? Uh, because if you look at the relationship of what is an artist, what's a craftsman, what's a designer, right? It's, it, it can be very blurry, it can be also very, very distinctive as well. Right? So I, I think there's something for us to think about. Uh, and yeah, and it might open up another conversation in relation to one about the interdisciplinary part of it as well. Chua Hui, I wonder whether I can pick up on how you started your answer on the where. Uh, I think of interdisciplinarity um, not in the classical 90s way, um, when the term started coming uh, into vogue. I'm thinking about inter as an in-between. The way in which we have been disciplined into a particular identity, which of course also comes with pride, a sense of professionalism. That is important. It gives us our sense of situatedness in the world. What interdisciplinary an interdisciplinary studio fine arts practice, which we have at LaSalle, sits in between the different types of ways in which we have been disciplined into a practice. I think what we're trying to cultivate in these programs, diploma, bachelor's, honors programs, and masters, is that the in-betweenness is a place of dwelling. And we can stay there. It's not so much that we resist choice or decision, but that the space in between is always open, always vibrant, always full of possibilities that haven't been articulated yet. So maybe that is a, a one way of um, speaking to the distinctions that Chua Hui mentioned just now. I'd like to pick up on the in between because that's my passion of learning as well. Um, for me, interdisciplinarity is really a part of a rich semantic of different types of disciplinary. We have transdisciplinary, paradisciplinary, supradisciplinary, and these are all terms that help us to break free of the disciplinary compartmentalizations. Um, I think what's very important in this notion of interdisciplinary is that we need to return back to the essential questions of a classically trained discipline. What are the core values and the core skills within the discipline that allows us to cross boundaries, blur boundaries and find new synergies? In the art space, we haven't had enough time to really sit and enjoy the basic fundamentals of what we could do when we come together as trans professionals to be able to enjoy that discursive space where we are set free from assessments, where we are set free from assignments to en allow our students to enjoy an interspace of projects that becomes a polysemous discursiveness that we need in higher arts learning. I think one way of uh, reflecting on interdisciplinarity is to revisit the notion of the discipline no? before the prefixes <laughs> tend to hijack the discussion. Uh, we might want to, to look at what a discipline, what constitutes a discipline. What is it exactly? Is it uh, some kind of protocol? Is it uh, a uh, precondition to to a level of rigor is it just an integrity of procedure or just a uh, a way of making things no so i think we have to 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 revisit then the notion of 
of, of discipline. And I think the problem is when the idea of discipline is conflated with specialization and uh, professionalization. I think this is uh, uh, another, other, another problem when we think of the discipline in terms of this formalist specialization that creates uh, uh, territoriality or turf or uh, let's say career. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm looking at the humanities as, as another way of uh, enhancing procedures without lapsing into this uh, trap of, of, of the discipline. Yeah. You know, what's uh, great about transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary practices is when <clears throat> various people of different expertise come together. And uh, I still, though, can't help but feel that within an undergraduate setting, it is the time to actually build those, those, that language and that skill set. Uh, so that when we do come to meet with, with people of different disciplines, we, we can come together. Um, so I, I guess I have a, a very middle ground position with this, that there is, there is still the beauty and primacy of, of having deep skills and knowledge in, in a domain uh, before branching out. And anecdotally, I mean, this is not entirely new, obviously, because uh, I was actually teaching in La Salle uh, back in the late 90s, and there were very strong interdisciplinary classes between medias, uh, dance, and music students. So um, it's, it's an interesting revisit, actually, for me. Thank you all very much. Another sort of uh, big picture issue that I'd like to invite uh, perhaps some of you to reflect on, um, which also addresses some of the questions we've had, is the connection between the past and the present and the future. We've heard a lot from actually all of you about the challenging present that we live in and, and, and the sort of sense of foreboding of the future. Um, we've heard about the dynamic market, we've heard about the burning platforms, but we, equally we've heard about the enduring traditions that we've inherited. We've heard about um, uh, we've heard about uh, the, the, the learning from the, um, the traditions of the university and the museum, for example. So two questions that have been asked from the audience, which I think we can answer together in relation to not just the present and the future, but also the past, would be how do we ensure that arts curricula remain relevant to in evolving industry needs and technological disruptions? And a lot of arts education is future-oriented, such as with digital and AI, have we discarded the pedagogical gems of old fine art masters and their cultural traditions? So big picture questions about the ways in which the transformations and instabilities we're facing in the present and we're envisaging in the future perhaps can be tackled with lessons learned from the past. Go ahead. So, you know, if, if if a school's done their job right, uh, the arts curricula will enable the learner to be ready for a future, uh, a, a future with a big question mark. Um, yes, the arts curricula will need to keep up, and that's the burden of the institution, but I, I do think that if we'd done, the, if we'd done our job right, uh, we would have set the learner up to be able to, to face an uncertain reality. Um, Moving on to the question of the gems of the past from the fine arts masters, I, I have to admit, um, I'm a fine arts trained painter person, and uh, so my predilection is there. And there is definitely beauty in it, and, and I think that's why I am a proponent that we should celebrate deep skill within our domain uh, and use certain opportunities when we develop sufficient language to then branch out into interdisciplinary uh, explorations and, and learning from that. Maybe just to follow on that is exactly the, the, the question that I always have in mind, right? You know, when, when you are an artist, when are you a craftsman and when you are labelled as a designer or you are a designer? Uh, it's, it's the kind of relationship which 
yeah, backed into, I mean, if you're talking about practice, uh, it's, it's, it's about really how do we then, you know, uh, create that space for the, for the designer to think, right? Uh, because most of the time, the designer are given a brief, right? And you need to answer the brief to, the, uh, to what is required from the business, right? Very functional in that sense. Uh, but in the practice and in the, in, in, in the discipline of, of, uh, of the practice itself, where that's where I see the relationship where the arts can come in to really inspire design. Like, uh, Paul, you, you say that you are a fine art painter. I mean, I, will, I can put you on the same axis with and somebody else which is a communication designer. Right? He, he, he or she will get inspired by you. Right? Likewise, uh, a product designer can be inspired by a sculptor. Right. So what I'm painting is actually the bookends of the relationship between design, there's a discipline, and art. And I think that's the relevance that I think I want to bring in back into, um, well, you can call it the pedagogical part of it, which is not my expert area, but and as, as a practitioner, that's also where we, in the business, we create what we call oxygen time for designers so that they can explore. One of the pillars in the recommendation that I mentioned just now in the point of vision for design education going forward in the next 30 years, one particular component is about experimentation. And here, we are really encouraging the IHLs, the design education IHLs, right, to really push for experimentation. And perhaps then if I may extract the arts, and in my own definition of what the arts is, right, it all boils down to, it's about experimentation, it is about expression, and it's about cultivating that sensitivity. And that's what we need that would complement the education of design. Yeah. Thank you, Sissy. Thank you. Um, please remind me uh, to cycle back to exactly um, where Chihuahua ended. Um, I was just going to make a, a very simple point that how brightly a gem shines depends on how it's cut be it a diamond with however many points, or pedagogical gems. So if we think about the multiple angles through which light could be refracted through this gem, uh, that is arts education or what have you, perhaps it's not about compromising one type of learning for another type of learning. I'm not sure that we need to think about anything as a zero-sum game, and that includes climate action. I think what arts can do is encourage us to think of better problems, phrasing it differently, contextualizing it differently, seeing it from different angles, realizing that every problem that we solve create other problems anyway. So what exactly are we trying to resolve here? What can we do as individuals who make and think and act in the world? And regarding the point uh, that Chokwe ended on um, about what arts can do for design or do collaboratively with design, I would like to posit perhaps um, puts us in better stead um, as makers, as people who are creative, is that arts thinking hone amongst many other things, judgment. Judgment is not being judgmental, but the way in which we are able to distill that which we look through. So what is the lens that allow us to be able to visualize, sense, hear, smell in common? something which always requires us to be in community in order to establish. Otherwise, it's just an opinion. And I think there's something aesthetic about the way that we judge. There is argument, there is rhetoric, there is logic, and all sorts of ways in which we take decisions. But I think judgment requires an aesthetic sensibility. It is also in the poetics of how we express, deliver, argue, come together, make, and be. I think because it is not directed at only one thing, 
in order to resolve a problem, come up with a product that would reduce X and increase Y, right? It requires us to be willing to take the time to form judgments. Thank you all. In the earlier panel, we heard about the key attributes that graduates from arts education programs must possess to be ready for the world, including to be ready for industry. But I think there's a desire amongst the audience to put some of us on the spot now and to think about what are the key attributes needed in teachers, needed in educators, needed in institutions that educate. Let me read you a couple of questions and uh, you could think about how you might like to speak about um, the, the qualities that are required for teaching the arts in Singapore today. One question is, um, uh, where have they gone? Sorry. What one core skill do teaching faculty require to deal with the multiple opportunities and complexities of the world and the student body today? Another question. How can an art curriculum encourage students' freedom in creativity and imagination rather than limiting it? Sasi, I think that goes back to some of the comments you made earlier. And a third question, which I think uh, indirectly asks the same, is asking about the same issue. If you were the Minister of Education today, um, how, what would be your vision and aspiration for the University of the Arts Singapore? So can I invite uh, whichever of you would like to speak first to talk about the attributes and qualities, the competence, competencies that are required to teach the arts today? I don't think I will answer the third question, but I'll try to talk first at the second one. Um, well, as an artist educator, we've always seen changes along the way. And in response, actually, to Roger's earlier points about the past and the present and the future, it's about the respect for the past that would help us to renegotiate what we need for the future. Um, there was this musicologist by the name of Richard Taroskin who used to tell us that in the present, we're having the pastness of the presence and the presence of the past. I think this is something that we can think about as educators, about what is really the authenticity of what is worth today in the way that we teach, cultivate, and create new ways of critical judgment among our learners. So I think it's important for us as well to reconsider letting go of ourselves. And denying ourselves sometimes requires us to belong in the arts to the liminal space, as Sasi had rightly mentioned. Um, Pedagogies of liminality, for example, help us as arts educators recognize that we are living in a transitional space. That transition is a rite of passage. We are exploring, we are allowing for creative ambiguity. We are given that opportunity to just explore new identities like ChatGPT without actually having to conform to it. And this level of experimentation is critical in how we would like to invest our colleagues in how arts education can advance its cause and its place. A second question that I also want to lead would be, when the university is formed, are we a leader or a follower of the industry? How much worth is this university to build questions that leads the industry to want to follow education rather than always the education following after the lead of the in in industry? And this requires research. I can't belabor more the point of the importance of the intellectual and the artistic thinking that we need to be able not just to form conditions of innovation, but conditions of emergence. Will, will any of you other teachers dare speak about the, the core, core competencies, um, competencies required? Yeah. I think the first thing should be the ability to, to overcome binary thinking. This is very important. Many problems come from that even this idea of the past or the present, tradition and the contemporary, uh, these problems come from um, almost inveterate <laughs> uh, binary thinking. So a, 
a good teacher, a productive teacher of the arts should be able to um, develop exercises uh, uh, for the students to, to negotiate the, the, uh, the first and second moments of the, of the binary and aspire to a, a third one, uh, maybe through imb imbrication, right? So that's one. Uh, second is uh, the ability to speculate. I think speculative, uh, 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 speculation is important in arts education and, and maybe we can revisit the idea of practice which is uh, situatedness in an ecology. I look at practice as a, a practical becoming, no? a practical becoming without being over-determined by preconceived protocols of, of, of discipline. And finally, I think a good teacher of the arts uh, should, uh, and this is my, my bias, uh, should have a curatorial, a curatorial sensibility. The ability to constellate, the ability to gather, the ability to create uh, relationships among uh, diverse uh, materials in the world. Yeah, um, maybe not addressing the, the question directly, but I think in, in one of the uh, um, ideas that actually we propose in the Design Education Advisory Committee, it is about how do we um, create a seamless exchange of, uh, you know, to, to have the fluidity between the industry and the, and the education sector so that the flow of expertise, right, actually goes both ways. Uh, I think we are seeing pockets of that happening, but probably not at the level which from both sides uh, are satisfied with. And I think that's something that we can think about to keep the currency uh, of those uh, that would be in the education sector, but as well, that could flow back into the industry. Because I think we, want, we need to change the relationship, as I mentioned, that currently is a supply and demand kind of relationship. Right? The industry will say, this is what a, these are the kind of designers we need, give it to us, right? And then the schools are given a few years to train them up, right? And not easy. Uh, that's where we say that, well, perhaps the industry should also have a skin in the game as well. So by having this seamless exchange between these two entities, that is probably one way to keep uh, the, the, the level uh, of, um, of knowledge, of expertise, right? Uh, very current, but at the same time, I think the IHLs have um, very strong opportunity to be the inspiration for the industry as well. I mean, the richness of resource, the capabilities, the experience and the knowledge. This is something that the industry should be tapping into, right? So you talk of, there's a, the, the, the part about uh, the, history, the historical aspect of it as well. But I think um, to really uh, foster a greater fluidity between the design education, the IHLs, and the industry is something that we need to uh, probably uh, be working on as well. Thank you. And a reminder that in, in thinking about what it is, what's required to teach, we were also asked to think about what's required to encourage freedom in creativity and imagination rather than limiting it. I wonder if any of you might like to speak on this matter. Um, yeah, I think, I think one of the key characteristics of a good teacher would be to instill in the student a sense of conviction and faith in the art that he or she has chosen. And this comes from the ability to be able to get the student to commit to the discipline of the craft and to instill a sensibility, an ethical sensibility of having the courage to stick with your convictions. If I may, I mean, almost 10 years ago to, to the day, there was a Singapore artist by the name of Sam Lowe. I don't know if you're all familiar with her. She began uh, a project where she put stickers on, uh, in the public, in, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, pedestrian crossings, on the road, 
uh, on walls, uh, which essentially teased, provoked, uh, challenged these uh, spaces and these objects that were in public view. The artist was arrested, charged, and thankfully, finally released. And, uh, you know, she, she began uh, uh, this work which opened the eyes, and again, I think this comes back to the point of the line between art and design and creativity, uh, where some of her original creations and her ideas are now used by society at large. She has become accepted, as it were. Whereas she began as someone who was on the fringe, who was marginalized, and who was, to some extent, rejected. But this is the nature of society. There will be uh, these forces that tend to not be able to see the relevance or the significance or the truth of the work that the artist is making. And unless teachers and institutions are prepared to teach students to have the conviction of their, of their belief, of their work, uh, there will be, we will be poorer for it as a society and as a people. And I think teachers must be committed to do this. Yeah. Thank you, Sasi. I think, I think some of your comments address another question from the audience, which is, in the age of outrage, art is being evaluated for its moral correctness. What would you say to students who are afraid of creating art that provokes? Now, I think some of Sassi's comments address this question. I think this question also makes visible that as much as we are dealing with technological transformations, we're also dealing with chain discursive changes, changes in the ways that competing ideas, uh, differing ideologies even, are uh, mediated and managed within um, civil society, within public discourse, and also within the classroom. So I wonder if any of the rest of you might like to speak to this question of um, what would you say to students who are afraid of creating art that provokes? May I give it a stab? Stab away. All right. I'll combine the last two questions, if that's all right. As I recall, um, the... Uh, second to last question there has to do with um, how do we create a liberatory environment for arts education, something of the sort. Um, I think Rebecca spoke to that um, during her five minutes a bit. Um, I wonder whether I can share a story. Um, when I was recently in Canada uh, a few years ago, went to a workshop, it's uh, a creative workshop for policymakers run by an art collective from Melbourne called Refuge, specifically about climate resilience. So that's a context. And the sharing came from an indigenous teacher um, from a First Nations uh, community in British Columbia. Um, so Vancouver, Canada, West Coast. And the anecdote is as follows. Um, a child was asked what they learned uh, after having been taught how to weave. So this is an effort to, to bring the child back into a culture and a, a tradition which has been uh, taken away from the child's parents because the parents were put through residential school where language, culture, traditions, and family ties were erased and decimated. And the child answered, what I learned is that I know how to weave. And the teacher corrected them and said, no, no, you learned how to weave in class today. And the child insisted, no, I learned that I already knew how to weave. So there is something about history that is embodied, that is intergenerationally felt, might emerge at different moments. And I think perhaps the liberatory conditions that allows for that to emerge somehow is a 
digital in the dexterous way. It is in the process of making when you're thinking about something else that you realize. And I think that is liberatory, especially in a pedagogical setting where perhaps there is a cur uh, curriculum to follow, reading lists to have to rush through, tests to have to be administered, right? So um, to answer an earlier question, completely agreed that courage is absolutely necessary um, in any education and in arts education because it is so fertile for these ways of knowing to come back to students through the ways in which the more tactile, the more material processes actually allow emerge. I think also care. Back to listening and maybe the resonant frequencies in a space that allows one to be relational with oneself, with others, with different domains of understanding and knowing and I'm intentionally not using the word knowledge and not using the word production, right? In these circumstances, um, perhaps we could say to that um, student who is afraid, what is it that you're afraid of losing? What do you have to lose in this environment? That is the institution that gives you the space between those walls, whether they're made of glass or not, to experiment, to be open, this one year, these three years, right? Do you really have something to lose? Yeah, I, I, I don't like to pick up on that point, actually, because we, we did speak about it before this came on stage here, is that you know, I think one of the things that we need to, to contend with is that there's too much rationality in the society today, right? And if I translate into the business world, that everything is measured on a return of investment, and that translates into the overall behaviour of a society as well. Um, and, and I think that's exactly uh, why that, you know, uh, we, we only want to learn the things that we think will be useful. But guess what? We can't predict what the world is going to be, right? COVID is a good example. Uh, there is no playbook that the government could take out from the drawer and say, yeah, we're going to follow this solution. Right? That's why you need creativity, you need thinking which is uh, beyond what is, what is learned. So I think that irrationality, which it could be a good thing, and I think the arts actually uh, can actually provide that space. And that's why I, I really want to draw that line of sight from arts to design and from design directly into a contribution to, to the economy. Um, then, you know, it, it's, it's really to bring in that conversation. Um, another thing I think we need to think, we, we, we maybe let's remind ourselves is that up until into the, into the 1920s, right, there's no such thing as a design school. It's always been school of arts, right? Because uh, if you talk about product design, which I'm trained in, right, is, is that uh, until to the time of mass production, a table is crafted by a craftsman. Right. A hard-working craftsman would craft 10 a day until machines came, right? His role changed. So I think let's not forget that and maybe let's bring that back because somehow along the way in the 40s and in the 50s when mass production really took off, arts was relegated, right? And there's this separation of arts and design somehow because of this economic axis or that track that it went towards and suddenly arts was left alone. Right. So I, I, I guess it's, it's about how do we bring it back again because I, I really think that the importance of arts as the imaginative space, that space to challenge, the space to train the mind, uh, to really provoke, right, that will really complement the very rational act of design practice, the use of creative, uh, creative thinking or capability. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to just pick that up as well. To the student who's uh, dealing with this dilemma uh, on creating work that provokes, uh, I would actually say that, you know, through history, the arts, we've actually used allegory, symbol, a small innuendo to, to be able to relay things that are very provocative. 
Um, think Animal Farm, you know, George Orwell's Animal Farm, for instance, as a low-level example. Uh, and I think part of the part of the joy of being that artist is to be able to suggest, to be able to put across a narrative that 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 may, on the surface, appear really harmless, but carries significant weight. And I think this is this is definitely a skill of a visual artist uh, that can be done. So it doesn't net, your message doesn't need to go across via provocation and slapping them in the face. Flirt, suggest, you know, these are, these are, these are tools for you. Thank you, Paul. We have time only for one last question. I've been, uh, received, been, been told that there's about five minutes left for us. So I'm gonna ask each of you to speak for just uh, 30 seconds or so on the question of collaboration, on the question of cooperation, which goes back, of course, to the, the fundamental vision of the University of the Arts as a union of La Sala and NAFA. Uh, it connects also to some comments we've had about linking between the arts and design, linking between um, practice and industry. Um, it also uh, addresses some of the questions from the audience, such as thinking about um, uh, models for collaborative research between disciplines and between institutions. So big picture question, collaboration, cooperation. Final thoughts, please. If you're interested in it, drop the person an email. I mean, it's... <laughs> Let's be honest, um, we can wait for the institution to make that connection for us. Um, but why? Why not, I mean, if you're a student, okay, and, I'm, and, I, and I am addressing you if you're a student. If you're a student, go make that, go send them an email. Say, I'm really interested. What's the worst thing that happened? They say no, right? Um, as an organization, if you're an instructor, a lecturer, a professor, oh, just drop them an email as well. Uh, I don't wait for the MOU to be signed. I think there's really no stopping of us actually st just starting and just doing it. Um, I would have to also say that within an institution, we do have our certain thrusts and our certain agendas, simply because we take in students who are interested in a specific area of study in the arts or in design. Um, for us, our primary focus still remains with creative practice, the practice of making, draping, composing, performing, playing, you have it all. So within this creative practice, um, we have to keep our vision focused on embodying um, aesthetic experiences, enacting pedagogical practices, and even addressing and enclosing artistic products. So within these main thrusts that we have of creative practice, uh, one of the key areas of research is not about the topic, but about the skill of deep and good quality inquiry. This requires rigor, this requires resilience, patience in the way that you are addressing the issue and focusing on it in a very deep way. And that requires collective gestures as well among communities to be able to bring forward these discursive views and find a common denominator to find a new agenda forward. So I would say that we welcome very much discursive practices and different types of stakeholders to come together to do research in the arts because this really generates new energy for us. What you've seen of this post-lunch um, performance, for example, is an example of an interrogation about a musical work that has a catalyst that places into action contemporary dance techniques. We were, among our panel, even able to address some Thai, some Filipino, some Chinese ethnic dance gestures that makes us interrogate the sense of what is art, what are the core and essential values within those art forms, and helps us to address interculturalism, another aspect for which would be an important agenda in a way forward for Singapore. Well, I imagine the, uh, 
University of the Arts uh, initiative as a kind of institutional consolidation. And it's not entirely bad, uh, but there might be also, uh, on the other hand, an overinvestment in things that are marked as art. So I think uh, one way to complicate this uh, too much belief in the arts is to uh, do research or collaborate with, uh, uh, with persuasions that, that do not easily belong to, to the category of, of art. So I think that's the, a good way to begin uh, a collaborative project within this uh, uh, University of the Arts scheme. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if, if I may, very quickly, I think by all means, I mean, give collaboration uh, its rightful place uh, in this institutional setting. But do please bear in mind that uh, give priority to collaborations which engage the minorities. Give priority to collaborations that engage the fringe, uh, that are off, uh, off uh, the mainstream. Uh, this is where I think risk is highest where you are you have a stake in uh, what the outcome is going to be and where there's a possibility of something new and exciting uh, emerging i think that uh, once you enter the industry once you enter the profession once you enter your your careerist uh, uh, domains the opportunities to do this kind of work whittle away. So I think the university should be the ground where students can collaborate, which is risky. Yeah, perhaps I would say that, uh, you know, um, make UAS accessible to the industry, right? Um, and, you know, just take on any collaborations that come. You know, keep an open mind. I mean, I think that's the best way to really normalize Right, and, and, and then people get to know what U.S. is up to. If we could expand the idea of a university um, and the universality that was discussed earlier into a pluriversality, what would it feel like? What would it look like? Um, I wonder whether in the context of civilizations and foundings um, and whatever we might feel of it, even off democracies, there's always the inside and the outside, the exclusionary ring of so-called citizenship. If we could suspend that for a moment and consider what collaboration can be with the more than human, be it a chatbot, be it machines that can learn, that can entertain, um, to our larger environment, so wider, and non-human ecologies in which we also dwell. Perhaps that is one of the more challenging collaborations we have yet to consider. Thank you all very much. That's all we have time for today. It's been a pleasure to hear from you all and it's been a pleasure to receive so many interesting questions from the audience. So thank you all very much and here's to more conversations.